Hi, I'm Mary Ellen Iskandarian. I'm president and CEO of Women's World Banking, and I've just written a book called There's Nothing Micro About a Billion Women. I'm here to talk about why microfinance isn't a solution to women's financial inclusion. So microfinance was born in the 1970s. It was all about providing very small, unsecured loans to very poor people ostensibly to help them start and grow businesses. Loans typically had very high interest rates, but they also had very high repayment rates, particularly by women. So soon enough, microfinance became known as the silver bullet, the panacea solution to poverty. So it really captured the world's attention and the attention of the capital markets because it was seen as a powerful way of doing well by doing good. You had loans with nearly 100% repayment rates. Microfinance institutions were able to earn returns on assets of 5% when regular commercial banks struggled to achieve even 1% to 2% returns. And you had billions of dollars of capital flowing into microfinance institutions to support these loans. And all of this culminated in 2006 when Mohammed Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize for his pioneering work at the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, and microfinance was held as a solution for lasting peace. So the original microfinance model was based purely on debt. They weren't regulated, they weren't licensed in any way to take customer deposits. All they really could do was lend money. So probably not surprisingly, this resulted in a lot of very poor, vulnerable people ending up with way too much debt and in over their heads. And as researchers started to look into it, you saw that even the people who could manage the debt really weren't getting enough capital and enough support to grow their businesses and to do all of the great things that had been promised with that original idea of microfinance. So at best, we saw poor families being able to borrow to maybe smooth consumption if there was a month when they didn't earn as much as they had the previous month or if they faced some kind of emergency. Just having debt made available to you really isn't the full solution. Low-income people need a convenient and affordable way to send money and make payments. They need a safe place to save their money, but they also need insurance products so that they can manage risks and protect all that they've built. So one of the most exciting developments since those early days of microfinance is that today, many financial services, particularly to poor people and people in more remote areas, are delivered through mobile phones. And so having access to that phone is wonderful, but it's not enough. People need to, and this is something where women really struggle sometimes is they have to have the confidence to navigate the technology to take full advantage of those financial services. So our poorest people, our most vulnerable people, also really all of us need to be treated with dignity and not in a predatory way where they encounter hidden fees or very, very high interest rates, but to be treated as valuable customers for financial service providers. So women in every age group, every income group, from every geographic region, really every demographic indicator you look at, are denied these critical financial products and services to a much greater extent than men are. And they are much less likely, 18% less likely in fact, less likely to own a smartphone than a man is. And we know how essential that is to being financially included. So this is where Women's World Banking comes in, and I've written quite a bit about all of this in, in the book. So in addition to working with financial service providers, we also work with regulators and policymakers to make sure that they understand the importance of inclusive policies that level the playing field so women can gain access to finance at the same rates that men do. So we also put our money where our mission is, and we take direct investments in inclusive financial institutions to try to influence the change from the board table. And we really encourage lots of other people to start investing with that gender lens and join us in this really exciting investment strategy. We all have to be much more conscientious consumers of our financial services. Do you even know the gender diversity of the organization that you bank with, or your insurance company, or the people who manage your money. 
we know that gender diverse financial institutions are much more likely to reach more women clients. They're actually also much more resilient in the face of, of shocks. We saw the financial institutions that had women on their boards came through the financial crisis in much better, much better shape. The other thing you can do for yourself and your kids is start financial and digital literacy much earlier than you would even imagine. But the research shows that as early as age five, kids are learning those concepts and have a much better chance of retaining them. And then finally, look at your investment portfolio. Are you thinking about products that address women's needs, that serve women, companies that are led by women? That's an important lens to start thinking about as you make your investments. So the reason this is so important and why I've written a book about it, I've really dedicated my life to it, and women's world banking is so laser focused on women in the financial sector, both as clients and as leaders, because we know when we have more women in finance, more women having access to finance, it leads to stronger institutions, but it absolutely leads to a more equitable world. So yes, a billion women not included in the formal financial system, that's a big problem. But the thing that's so exciting about it is there, there literally is something that even you at home can do to move the needle on women's financial inclusion.